My name is Peter Gurry, and I am an assistant professor at Phoenix Seminary and a co-director of the Texan Canon Institute there. And to my right here is Dr. John Mead, who's my co-director of the Institute. And to his right is Dr. Peter Gentry, who is his mentor at Southern Seminary. And we're here uh, today to talk a little bit about the Origin Colloquium that we're putting on this fall. It's November 18th and 19th here in Phoenix. And both of these gentlemen will be speakers there. So we want to talk a little bit with you about the importance of Origin his text critical work, and then of course about the colloquium as well. So maybe we could start if you two could tell us a little bit about Origen's significance, and Peter, maybe I'll start with you. Tell us a bit about Origen and where he fits in the history of the church and why he's so significant. Well, Origen was a church father. He was a Christian scholar. Mm -hmm. And uh, just for a point of reference, he died in 253, around, around that time. Okay. And he began his uh, his uh, life and training in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. He taught in the uh, school there. Mm -hmm. And uh, later in his life, he moved to uh, Caesarea in Palestine. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, there was a uh, large Jewish population mm -hmm. in uh, Caesarea, so there was lots of opportunity for dialogue between Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that raised a number of questions Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. want to talk about that, uh, John? <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, maybe just to put it simply. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's no doubt uh, that in Caesarea, uh, Origen becomes more and more acquainted with and introduced to some of these, uh, not only the Hebrew text uh, of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. uh, but he also seems to become more acquainted with uh, Jewish revisions of the already existing Greek translation, which we popularly call the Septuagint. Mm, okay, right. so the Septuagint translated, you know, <laughs> sometime around 250 BC, uh, all the way down to maybe 100 BC, something like this. All the books, and um, but the Jews were already kind of revising mm. that text. And by the time of Origins Day, there were three popular names attached to three major versions, uh, Theodosian, Aquila, and Symmachus. Right. Okay. And uh, he seems, after he moved to Caesarea around 232, mm. he seemed to become more and more aware of the use of those versions. Mm. And they took different readings than the established old translation. Do you want to talk to us about Isaiah yes. 714, maybe? Well, yeah. So... Obviously, the Christians were attempting to prove that Jesus was the Messiah mm -hmm. from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they had discussions with Jewish people, uh, the Jewish people would say, well, that's not exactly uh, what the Hebrew text says. You're quoting the Greek right. translation, right. but if you could read the Hebrew, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you would know that it doesn't exactly say that. So, for example... <laughs> There's a debate over Isaiah 7:14, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a virgin will conceive right. mm -hmm. and bear a son, right. and Christians interpret that as a prophecy of the coming Messiah. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the by the second century A.D., uh, Jewish interpretation was pretty firmly entrenched that this was a young woman and not necessarily a virgin. Right, right. And so there were many passages like that mm -hmm. where Christians and Jewish people had very lively debates mm -hmm. uh, and the Christians were decidedly disadvantaged because um, none of them knew Hebrew. Right. right. They're all reading the old, what we call the Old Testament in Greek. In Greek, at that point, right? yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So Origen comes along, he recognizes some of these disparities that are happening and the, the debates they're causing, and he decides to do what exactly? Well, he created uh, a Bible called the Hexapla. Okay. Uh, hex means six, mm -hmm. and pla means fold, sixfold, because it, had, it entailed six different versions. Uh, the first column, held the Hebrew text okay. in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew script. Yeah. The second column had the Greek text in Greek transliteration, so okay. letter for letter, Greek letter for Hebrew letter, wow. because the proper pronunciation of yeah. the text yeah. had not been recorded yet. So does that second column include vocalization? Yes, it does. Okay. So the, the, the Hebrew column, column one, is only the consonants. Yeah, right. And um, 
the column two yeah. in Greek form now also enshrines mm. the reading tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, in the fifth column, <laughs> he put uh, the Septuagint, the original okay. translation from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek. Okay. Is that what some would call the Old Greek? The Old Greek, yep. yes, okay. the Old Greek or the Septuagint. Yep. And then in columns um, three, four, and six, he put respectively these revisions mm. of the original Septuagint right. by Aquila, Symmachus, right. and Theodotion. Okay. Right. And so that way, he was able to do two things. Mm. He was able to compare how the Christian Bible, the Septuagint, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, the, the Christian church had adopted that from, from the Jewish people yep. in the time of Jesus. How the Christian Bible stacked up with the, with the Hebrew, mm -hmm. and then he was also able to compare that with uh, the way Jewish people were translating the Bible mm. at the same time. Right. Yep. So, Peter, tell us a little bit about, you, you mentioned these six columns. What's his goal in, in doing these? Does he want people to see the differences between them, or does he want them to pick one over the other five? But there's a lot of debate about exactly why Origen did this. Okay. But we shouldn't think that it's very strange because, you know, in the last century we have uh, multi-column Bibles. We have mm -hmm. the, the layman's parallel New Testament mm -hmm. where you can see the New Testament in the King James Version, in the New American Standard Bible, in the NIV. Right. Uh, so we have Bibles like this. So we're not sure whether uh, he was simply trying to see how the how the Greek, the original Greek translation stacked up with the Hebrew, mm -hmm. or whether he was concerned about uh, debating with Jewish people, mm -hmm. or whether he was doing textual criticism to try and improve mm -hmm. the quality of the original Greek translation. I don't know, can you think of any other? Yeah, ideas? so some scholars think uh, now, um, if you examine other columnar synopses mm -hmm. from the time mm -hmm. in say Greek and Latin, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, what some scholars are saying is these synopses were created say by by Romans mm. uh, to teach uh, to teach Latin speakers Greek right you see right. so so some have started to look at the hexaba also a columnar synopsis mm -hmm. uh, in a similar way maybe to teach Hebrew so a pedagogical function yeah maybe a pedagogical right. function hmm. um, that still wouldn't quite ex that would explain the presence of the first column You're right it may not explain the s presence of the second column readily yeah um, that, that letter for letter, right, right? transliteration or transcript, transcription column. Uh, but I think, I think given, this kind of goes right to the topic of the conference, and that is uh, Origen was a grammarian. Right. Origen was a philologist right. in the Alexandrian uh, Greco-Roman tradition. Right. Right. And, uh, and so as such, uh, he needed a way to read the text aloud. Mm. Okay, and so I don't know if we tend mm. to think of grammar as uh, <laughs> as giving us a way to read the text, mm -hmm. but that second mm -hmm. column would have given him a way to actually read the Hebrew text right. as it was read in his day. So, do we know where he where he got the vocalization in the second column? I assume that's coming from the synagogue. Probably through his interaction with Jewish people in Caesarea. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, there's some debate about that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it was, yeah. So I think there's more research that needs to be done on that. So speaking of the hexaplet, John, would you tell us a little bit about your new edition that's come out? Oh yeah. <laughs> and how that fits in. Right. Yes. Right. So so as you can tell from this this d wonderful description of what it was, mm. um, you could probably guess that it wasn't copied in mm. its entirety. Mm. Okay. Simply because it was too big. Yeah. Really? So so you know there are, are you know good social historians have shown that the hexaplet could have been created like once. Right. Maybe some books like in isolation may be copied. Like we have later copies of the Psalter, for example. Right. But really, of no other books right. in that columnar synopsis. Right. So um, so it was probably housed in the Caesarean Library, okay. where Origen made it. And Eusebius and others maybe curated it and mm -hmm. you know protected it. Other Christians talk about how they visited to see it, mm. um, but 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 somehow it's lost. And, and do we know he finished the whole Old Testament? We yeah, I yeah. think we know that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, I think we know that. And then um, your edition is of what? So so the edition is called the critical edition of the Hexapleric fragments. Right. Right. So so basically. Uh, the editor of an edition like this has to scour all the available sources mm. in commentaries, mm. the, the margins of manuscripts, right. 
and uh, yeah, ancient, unlike, ancient versions. Unlike you know. something like the Septuagint, where we have complete, say, complete manuscripts of right. the Psalter, we, we don't have a complete no. manuscript of the Hexapla. Of the Hexapla, right. no. So you're scouring other manuscripts that maybe have marginal notes right. and such things. Yes. But if yes. Origen yeah. hadn't right. produced the Hexapla, yeah. these Jewish Greek versions would not have survived. Right. So this is the oh. only way that any bits Survive. of these ancient, <clears throat> these are the earliest Jewish versions of the Bible. Right. Uh, they are very important, they are the some among the earliest witnesses to the Hebrew text mm -hmm. alongside of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Right. Uh, and uh, they are uh, important witnesses. Right. right, to the text of the Old Testament. To the text of the Old Testament, right. yeah. yeah. And when you say, Peter, by and large, they they agree with the um, what we call the Proto-Masoretic text. There's readings of Aquila, Symmachus, and Theodotion. Mm. What do you think their significance is? So they're early, like maybe just, just after the Dead Sea Scrolls, but what do you think that they add to our knowledge of the text history rather than, say, the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, what I think is important to realize is that by the time the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, the Hebrew Bible was already a thousand years old. Mm. And uh, therefore, it, uh, the average Jewish person couldn't understand it. Right. right. And so if you have a person who says, I'm going to copy this Bible exactly the way it's been handed down to me, mm. none of my children are going to be able to understand it. Right. So what he's going to do is he's going to produce paraphrases mm. at, the sa at the same time that he's copying the text exactly like he sees it, mm -hmm. he's also going to be producing paraphrases and commentary-like mm -hmm. right. uh, translations, right. Right. Uh, which is what you see in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. And uh, after the fall mm -hmm. of Jerusalem, this impetus to provide explanatory material mm -hmm. was no longer done in Hebrew because Hebrew died as a living language, mm -hmm. and uh, the Jewish people spoke Aramaic. So the explanatory tradition was carried on in Aramaic in the Aramaic Targums right. instead of in Hebrew. Right. But these Jewish Greek versions w are solid witnesses to the fact that there was a standard text. I right. see, okay. Right. So quite important then for textual studies of the Hebrew Bible yeah. in the Old Testament. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Tell us then a little bit, um, tell us a little bit about previous editions of the Hexapla. And then tell us a little bit, I want to ask about the, um, the conference that you were part of before, Peter, and how the conference that's coming up here at Phoenix Seminary connects to that. So maybe, it's John, tell us a little bit about the edition of Field. Oh, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there the are... Recent edition. Yeah, right? the recent <laughs> edition. Yeah, that's right. So, Peter, there are, there are many editions of hexapleric fragments um, going all the way back to, I mean, really the Reformation, okay. um, 1500s, 1600s. Okay. Um, perhaps, though, uh, Frederick Field, mm -hmm. 1875, okay. he, he's well known for collecting all of those fragments, okay. uh, but also now starting to add what we call Greek retroversions from Syriac, okay. from what's known as a source called the syro Hexapla. Okay. And uh, so he actually included those in an edition for the very first time. Right. And, and that's 1875. So 1875, since 1875, we have not had a critical edition of any of Origins fragments. And a correct? lot of a lot of new wow. fragments have come to light. Yeah. So in nineteen ninety four I had just barely finished my PhD and uh, three scholars uh, arranged a conference in Oxford, England. Okay. Uh, Alison Salveson, okay. uh, Leonard Greenspoon, mm -hmm. and Gerard Norton. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, paid for by an American by the name of Mark Rich. Uh, interesting name. They invited 15 scholars okay. and we met for 10 days Wow! and worked from 10 a.m. to 9 p.m. Wow. for 10 days. So that was the most intensive wow. study of the hexapla that had been done in a hundred years. Wow. Right. And uh, out of that conference was born in my heart and the heart of two or three others that we needed a new edition of the Hexapleric Fragments. To replace Field. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was already committed to producing Ecclesiastes in the Göttingen edition, mm -hmm. a critical edition of the Greek translation of the book of Ecclesiastes. 
So I tried to interest my doctoral students in working on the... Uh, <laughs> and you got lucky, you found something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. Okay, so out so, of this, the 1994 Rich Seminar is yes, born... is born what? the Hexable Project. Okay. And then a few years later, um, the, uh, the Hexapla Institute, right. which really came under the IOSCS, the International Organization for Septuagint and Cognate Studies. Okay. So under the auspices, so the Hexabla Institute kind of reports to IOSCS, okay. while the Hexabla Project is still uh, Peter's baby. Okay, so you're so, the director. Well, it's actually yeah. the other way around. The, oh. the, the Hexabla Institute is, is uh, stationed at Southern Seminary. Okay, where you teach. And yes. it's uh, it, it has a board, uh, Dr. Allison Salveson, myself, and uh, Dr. Bastar Har Romani, who's a professor now at the Free University of Amsterdam. He okay. was at Leiden University. The Hexapla Institute spawned uh, the Hexapla project. Ah, okay. I see. Okay. And the project is is making the additions. I see. And it's under the uh, sponsorship of the uh, Septuagint uh, Society. Okay. Right. So John's edition of, of Parts of Job is right. the first in the, that new series. The very first. Right? So 20... Okay. 25 years later, wow. John, uh, yeah. this well baby done. has been born. Right. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. a big baby it is. <laughs> so, okay, then bring us up to speed from 1994. Now we have the publication of the first edition, the first new edition as part of this project. Yep. Now connect us to the conference that we're hosting here at Phoenix Seminary through the okay. Texan Canon Institute right. and tell us how that fits into the Rich Seminar and to this to okay. the project. Okay, well, as, so 25 years later, from, 25 years from the Rich Seminar, mm -hmm. We're, we're now doing, uh, again, another conference or colloquium mm -hmm. on this whole topic. It's not so much on the hexapla, because now, I mean, a lot of work's been done on the hexapla, but mm -hmm. there's a little bit more work still that needs to be done on situating origin in his l context of late antiquity okay. as a grammarian or right. a philologist. And so, so right. the conference here, yes, we'll talk quite a bit about the hexapla, mm -hmm. but really it's more interested in contextualizing origin and his work as a grammarian. Right. You know, I mean, if you, anyone knows origin, you're thinking in terms of a philosopher right. or a theologian, theologian. Right. most popularly. I mean, he's right. an allegorist kind of interpreter right. of scripture. Right. But what most people don't realize is that he put a lot of blood, toil, and sweat mm -hmm. into uh, actually correcting errors in copies of manuscripts mm -hmm. uh, of the Greek Old Testament, right. you see. Right. And uh, the Hexapla was kind of born out of that. Right. And, so. and it was carried forward by his disciples, Pamphilus, okay. who died in prison in 309 under the Diocletian persecution. Mm -hmm. And then it was carried forward by Eusebius, right. Right. who was, uh, who was uh, the Bishop of Caesarea, right. sponsored by Constantine right. uh, to produce 50 elegant Bibles. Right. And so he had a very <clears throat> uh, well-endowed uh, Scriptorium. Yes. <laughs> right. He had helpers. Yes. That's right. But they made doctoral students. They made okay. additions and corrections. Okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and they they probably even innovated a little bit. Okay. Well, not a little bit. They they innovated okay. the work of Origin. I Origin's see. work itself was an innovation. I see. Yep. Right. Um, we don't have time to go into the whole history of the book, sure. but but even yep. making such a, a massive columnar right. book, right. right, would have been right. pretty have been unique right. uh, in that day. So, right. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about um, the colloquium that we're hosting here in Phoenix? Uh, give us a little bit of a taste of what the topics are going to be that are covered there. You don't have to tell everything, obviously, but... I plan to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the reception of the Hexapla mm -hmm. uh, and the reception of probably another kind of spin-off edition of that called the Tetrapla. Okay. And there's no doubt that certain later Greek fathers like Epiphanius of Salamis, uh, Theodoret of Kurus, the, these church fathers uh, spoke and wrote in Greek, mm. and uh, and they made great use of of the textual work that came out of Caesarea. Okay. Okay. So I plan to I, I want to unpack that okay. and show a little bit of the afterlife of the scholarly edition, okay. the Hexapla. And, the and Peter, can you tell us, give us a little preview of what you're? Well. Uh, just about everything that concerns the hexapla <laughs> okay. is, is debated. <laughs> right. right. And uh, uh, John and I have been doing a lot of research since mainly 2013 mm -hmm. to uh, distinguish what was the hexapla and what was the tetrapla. The tetrapla means a fourfold version. Right. The four, there was a fourfold version that was derived from 
the, like rock, the Cliff Notes version. The Cliff, the well, Cliff Notes version. The Cliff of Notes book. versions, exactly. <laughs> and for, this was translated into Syriac, okay. and most uh, the, most of the what has survived is actually in Syriac. Wow. Right. Okay. Right. In the Syro Hexapla. Yep. In the so-called Syro Hexapla. Right. Origen made a lot of notes about how the Greek translation compared with the Hebrew text. Mm -hmm. Were those notes in the Hexapla, mm -hmm. or were they in the fourfold edition that was derived from the hexapla right. and uh, there's a lot of debate as uh, so we've actually uh, we are going after every source yeah we're going right to the basement on this and uh, seeking to uh, better reconstruct what is known about the early history of the hexapla right 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 that's right so I'm here talking with Dr. Peter Gentry from Southern Seminary and Dr. John Mead from Phoenix Seminary, and we're talking about the Origin Colloquium, which will be held here at Phoenix Seminary on March 11th and 12th of 2021. You can learn more at ps.edu slash origin, and you can go there to learn about the full list of speakers and uh, contributors to the colloquium, as well as buy tickets, which are on sale there as well, and learn more about um, housing and what your what your uh, conference fee will cover. Um, thanks so much, gentlemen. Is there anything else you would like to say about the conference or about Origin before we... Well, I'm, it'll be uh, the first time in 25 years that we have right. an intensive uh, analysis of this. Right. right, right. So it's really really a milestone in the study of Origin yeah. as well, yeah. right. Yeah. So thanks so much. We hope you can join us if you're interested in, in Origin and his scholarship and his important place in the history of the church, and especially in the transmission of the text of the Bible. Right. My name is Peter Gurry. I'm co-director of the Text and Canon Institute at Phoenix Seminary and assistant professor of New Testament.